Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Leadership Book of the Month. I'm Kelly Burns. Hey, Brett. Hi, how are you? Welcome, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. We are missing our buddy, Dave. Uh, he will be back with us next month, but um, we are excited to be with you. And if you are joining us live, please post us a note in LinkedIn. Um, I don't know if we can see it on YouTube if it's live, if you're joining us live there, but on LinkedIn, we would be able to see it if you post a note and let us know you're here. Um, feel free to also post a comment or a question as you um, have them as we go through our conversation about the wisdom of teens coming up. Um, mm -hmm. I'm Kelly Burns, the founder of Voyage Consulting Group, and um, I've been leading a book of leadership book of the month for um, quite some time. And Brett joined me. Uh, oh, shoot, I forgot what number this is. Is this 23? I, I didn't count, but I, I do have a comment about the date. I know I looked back on your website and we started our first one, uh, Psychology, the Influence of Persuasion by Dr. Robert Cialdini in September of 2021. So we yeah. are laughing into our third year. So uh, yeah, I'll make a quick comment about that before I turn back over to you. So yeah. I, I did, I jumped over to Kelly's website, which if you haven't been there, it's a great, great website. It's really well done. But yeah, to the point, this is our third year. And I started to look back at all the books and all the content. And I thought to myself, you know, it, it, we often don't do the postmortems, right? I was just talking to my team this morning and I said, hey, we like to run, at least this is my theory anyway, in 90 day sprints. And we like to always look at the next 90 day sprint or the next day, the next week. But there's so much value and I want to encourage everybody. There's so much value in reflection and, and it doesn't have to be really in depth. It doesn't have to take a lot of time, but just reflect on, hey, did I get done? what I said I was going to do. And then I always tell people, hey, then tell yourself what you're going to do. And then obviously reflect and just kind of rinse and repeat. But uh, as I started to kind of put that thought together, you know, I went down this rabbit hole of goals, objectives, strategies, tactics, and plan. I said, hey, let's just pull back from that. Let's just make the point about reflections and postmortem. So, uh, you know, congratulations, so Kelly, you know, solid two years. Yeah. And uh, my gosh, it's amazing. We're turning to year three and uh, we've already got the scripts laid out in terms of, not the scripts, but the actual titles that we'll be tackling. I think you're on the, on the website all the way out through February already. So fantastic yeah. content yet ahead. Yeah, and we have the books chosen through Q1 of 24. So right. we're ahead of the game now, not not uh, <laughs> discussing them at the last minute. And right, we, right. We reserve the right to choose a different book anytime, just in case something comes hot off the presses that we're eager to read and share. So uh, that uh, we uh, reserve that right. Uh, so we, we, we usually like to start with updates. So I do want to share an update that last week I was so excited to be with um, uh, room full of about 500, 600 women business owners at the NABO uh, conference, annual conference down in Austin, Texas. So NAWBO, National Association of Women Business Owners. So shout out to my NABO sisters. And, uh, you know, nothing like the energy of a group of five or 600 uh, women business owners that are just on fire. And yesterday was the 35th anniversary of um, the law called HR 5050, which included several things. But um, one of the main ones was that women business owners could get loans for their business. Oh. Prior to that, in 1988, not even that long ago, women would have to have a man sign for their loan. So even really? if it was her son, yes, like her little 12 year old son could sign, but a grown a grown adult woman couldn't sign a loan, uh, couldn't get a loan for herself in 1988. So oh NAGO founders and leaders uh, worked with con Congress and advocated and um, helped to get that law passed and, you know, and continue to advocate. So I just want to shout out and appreciate um, all of the work <clears throat> that that organization has done uh, to help women business owners uh, um, get established and grow and scale up and do all kinds of great things that are contributing to our communities and into families around the country. So um, I had a great, great week with um, all of them. And I want to remove this and show my necklace is from one of the women um, NABO <coughs> members, um, Pearl's Pearls with purpose. And uh, so I got that last week. I can take it off of. If you go, oh, he's coming back. Um, yep. 
Pearls with Purpose is uh, one of the business women business owners that was there. And um, I also want to do a shout out to Wells Fargo and uh, my friends there. I did a post about them the other day, but phenomenal and just conversations and supportive of strong support of women business owners and uh, and really appreciate them as well. So over to you, Brett, for your update. Well, and thank you for that. I, I think we've, and you know better than I, I mean, I think we've come a long way in terms of gender equality in the business place, but I, I don't think our work is ever done and there's still much left uh, that to be done. So, but high five to you on that. That's awesome. So yeah. Kelly introduced herself. My name is Brett Getzel. Uh, I'm a business executive in the, the food distribution uh, supply chain space. I do quite a bit in the international trading, uh, primarily in protein and almost entirely in food service, but uh, focused on sales leadership. Uh, personal development, very passionate about that. I'll get into a couple other things, but very, very glad to be here with you guys. Uh, school's back in section, so not, not, not school anymore. Thank goodness. I think I've done all I, of the- I start tonight, school. so we have to end on time because I have there to go, you go. Yeah. Yeah. So my call out to that, if you remember from last year, I got really passionate about a non uh, nonprofit called Lead to Read. And it's an organization here in Kansas City where we're based, and it focuses on putting adult yeah. mentors into primary schools, largely with second graders. And really all you do is spend 30 minutes a week. Um, mine happens to be from 12 noon to 1230 on Tuesday, reading with second graders. And I, I, I constantly reflect on how I spend my time. And I keep asking myself, you know, with all that I've got going in the middle of the business day, can I really afford that? And you know what, I'm going to make it happen. And I always say that when we volunteer and give time, we often get more out of it than we put into it. But uh, mm -hmm. I'm considered what they call a flex truck because I can't commit to being there every week. So I usually rotate around from one student to the other. I've been fortunate enough, been doing it, you know, not a long time. There was one gentleman there I met that I knew, been doing it 17 years, literally been reading with second graders for 17 years. And, uh, but anyway, long story short, I, I got paired up with the, the same young man twice and uh, oh, the glow on his face when he saw me coming. And, you know, we go over punctuation and spelling and sound words and sight words, all those kind of things. So my point in all of that is, hey, if volunteering's in your heart, it's in your spirit, it's something you're passionate about, please, 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 you know, find a place to give back, to provide your services because the need is literally uh, infinite out there. But Lead to Read has happened to it aligns with my personal values. So it's something that, you know what, it's very easy for me to do because I, I uh, agree with a lot that they do. So that's the first thing awesome. uh, I kind of shared in some other conversations about different podcasts that I like. And one of them that I landed on was the Andy Stanley Leadership Podcast. Andy Stanley is the lead pastor at the North Point Church in Georgia, and he's got multiple podcasts. So if you do go searching for that one, make sure you look specifically for the Andy Stanley Leadership Podcast. So one of the things that we talk about is how do we learn? You know, obviously the focus of what Kelly and I are spending our time here on is leadership and personal development. So in a recent podcast that Pastor Stanley had, he made the comment and just it's amazing how some of these things just kind of hit you, you know, right in the gut. And he said, we learn when we ask questions and when we read. Right. Mm -hmm. We learn when we ask questions and when we read. So then my call out or my challenge to our listening group is to say, hey, reflect on your behavior and look over your day, reflect on your day and say, how many times did I ask questions? If I didn't ask any questions and I was the one doing all the talking, I probably wasn't learning. And then obviously the other part of that is how much are you reading? So think about those two behaviors, right? Are you reading and are you asking questions? And if you are, I think the connection that we can make is that you're probably learning. I, I tied that back to one of Covey's habits, habit five, right? Seek first to understand. And that goes back to that listening mindset and obviously asking that perpetual question of why. So business wise, uh, team member development initiatives underway here. Actually, I'm hosting a workshop next week on Chris Voss's Never Split the Difference. Chris Voss is a former Kansas City FBI detective who kind of made a name for himself writing the book, Never Split the Difference. He rose to the lead chief hostage negotiator for the, for the FBI uh, and had did all kinds of crazy, crazy cases all over the world. What an incredible story. And uh, now he's obviously in the consulting space and out of the FBI and all of that. But uh, again, just this idea of continual learning, whether sometimes I'm able to transfer my knowledge to others and sometimes I'm able to learn myself. So we're going to follow that up with uh, the Go-Giver series, which is one written by Bob Berg. Uh, if you're familiar with that one, the Go-Giver is, is loosely based. At least it has a lot of connectivity to uh, psychology, which is the uh, the concept of reciprocity. So reciprocity is so, so powerful, both in your personal relationships as well as your 
professional relationship. So last, and this one I thought was kind of cool, I just was at a recent CEO roundtable, uh, something we do about once a month here in Kansas City with some local uh, small business owners. And the, it's a group of CEOs, obviously, and, and founders and owners. And then there's kind of their next generation, if you want to think of that. And we go around the table and share successes and opportunities and things like that. And one of the junior executives was sharing how they started a what I would consider to be a monthly check in. And I, I just listened to him, you know, and it was for him. It was a really new thing. Right. It was kind of an epiphany, something they started. And and under my breath, I'm thinking to myself, this is not really new, but it's new to him. And, and as my mind kind of raced ahead, as I'm listening, you start to say to yourself, well, where do executives learn these things? Uh, you know, how do you come to know, hey, we need to have daily stand ups. We need to have weekly check ins. We need to have quarterly you know, updates. We need to have annual off sites. And for those that have been in the business, right, we, we've done these things for years. But there was a point there was a point we were all there at one point where we didn't know these things. They didn't come second nature and we were trained. We were mentored. Maybe we grew up in a Fortune 500 company that had all kinds of training. Who knows? But my point, I was able to give him a referral. There's a book out which I'm very high on called Traction by Gina Wickman. And it's an enterprise operating program, basically for founders, if you want to think of that, that don't come from industry and have had all of that training. So if you want to think of organizations that really stumble, you know, think of HOAs or church organizations or nonprofits and just think of how they meet day after day, week after week, spend all that time, and they just never get anything done. And then think if we were to operate that way in business, businesses mm -hmm. just simply aren't allowed to operate that way. So anyway, my takeaway there is, uh, you know, what traction by Gina Wickman, if you're in an organization or with a team, a business, a founder led business, something like that, and you're just not getting things done, you just don't have good structure, you're looking for a guide, you know, would be a North Star, uh, certainly pick that book up, I highly recommend it. Yeah, I liked that one too. And it um, when I read it, it was page by page of, um, yeah, that's how I learned it because I came up in a Fortune 500 company and that's what I learned and was mentored on. So that's what I incorporated into my own uh, companies along the way as well. So I have those practices, but the, um, you know, it is amazing when people didn't learn that, how do they learn? Um, and then that EOS system has um, coaches and guides that are, that you yeah. can hire. And um, a great one in Kansas City is Sonia Jury, J-U-R-Y. So look her up mm -hmm. on LinkedIn, um, reach out to me. I'm glad to connect anybody with her. She's fantastic knows that system like the back of her hand. She's a um, business colleague, um, former architect. And I don't know if you lose architect or not, but she's been an architect. Um, so business person. And I uh, would be glad to talk with anybody that wants uh, wants some help with that. Um, Thanks for the value add, Kelly. That was good. Yes. I didn't know that you would do that. So that's, yeah. that's phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. Big fan. Yeah. Uh, well, and this book kind of reminded me of those days as well. So the book mm -hmm. today um, the Wisdom of Teams. So um, Rhett and I buy the book. Dave, is, Dave reads it on his Kindle. But um, I like to see my, uh, I thought for sure this one, I was not going to have tabs. And then I still have tabs. Um, but this one I read when it first came out a long time ago. So um, it was it was kind of the Bible back then when it came out and you created your teams and you did things what the way these guys said. Um, but before we go into all the details, let me just tell you a little bit about um, why we picked it. Um, well, why we picked it now was because it was talked about again uh, recently as these authors are remain prominent in business circles. Um, it was talked about in um, a couple different forums that we, um, I don't know if it was in different podcasts or we both kind of came at it, I think, in different ways. Um, I think that's how it came up. But um, it was um, published originally in 1993 and then updated again and talked about again this year. Um, when it came out, Business Week called it the essential building block of the organization of the future. And more than 20 years later, Forbes credited it with making teams an essential part of the manager's playbook. So um, even all these years later, it's still credited as foundational. Um, and I think it's so interesting to go back and read it again to, um, to have seen teams struggle and they continue to struggle with the same things um, that they struggled with 30 years ago. <laughs> and, mm -hmm read the book and you won't have to struggle with all those same things. Right. Um, so about the author, so John Katzenbach um, attended BYU and graduated with distinction from Stanford 
and then got his MBA from Harvard. Uh, he served in the Navy in the Korean War, and he is a managing director of PwC. He also is with um, Booz and Company, and he founded his own firm, of course. And he also is with uh, McKinsey for more than 30 years. Um, Douglas Smith has a BA from Yale and a JD from Harvard. And he, uh, I don't know where John Katzenberg lives. Doug lives in New York. Um, and he's worked with hundreds of organizations from Fortune 500 to startups um, across different industries and privately held public um, government. He um, was McKinsey partner and co-founded the McKinsey Worldwide or, um, Organization Performance Practice and created the horizontal organization, which Fortune called the model for the next 50 years. Um, his bio just goes on and on and on. Um, I also thought it was interesting, um, a little more about him, that he taught high school math, physics, and chemistry in West Africa. Oh, um, and then, yeah, and this, um, and Doug also invented um, a type of video, nonlinear A-R-R-A-Y-E-D, -A -A -R -R -A -E arrayed video. It's a patented system and method for creating and viewing fully browsable video. So he patented, he helped contribute to how we see video on mm -hmm. online, I think. So like just so interesting that just a variety of things that people do. Um, and so that's the about the book and about the authors. So uh, Brett, let's start with just general thoughts. I kind of shared mine a little bit. Yeah, I, I really like the book. I mean, and I, I got at the tail end of the script here, but my my takeaway, you know, kind of cut to the chase is, would you recommend this? I, I mean, my answer is it depends, right? It depends on what your objective is. We, we really kind of say, hey, you're, everybody, I think, for the most part, is either on a team or leading a team. So there's value there. Uh, it, it's a heavy lift. I mean, it's a, it's a, a book with small print, a lot of pages. What I liked about it, the fact, though, it's not written like a research paper, so you don't get that heavy academic scholarly and, and there's plenty of research to it, plenty of use cases, which, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the use cases because it was written in 1993 or a little bit dated. So you get the privilege of looking at it in hindsight 30 years later to say, hey, how did this book age? But to your point, I mean, there's this is a foundational book that has a lot of tactical value. And I've kind of seen a pattern in my own self as I read the books and the ones that I enjoy the most are the ones that have those those guides, right? That give mm -hmm. recommendations, give suggestions. Uh, I'm less of a fan of the books that just simply, you know, re report case studies or report surveys or things like that. Those are those are valuable. But the ones that I think much like uh, Lead Human, Be Human, uh, this one that have almost like a practical user guide for team execution, I find those to be valuable. So, again, this, is, this book probably isn't for everybody, but it's certainly for, for many. Yeah, I agree. And I would say if you um, lead a team or you put teams together, um, you lead teams of teams, that this is a, um, a, it gives a roadmap for how to make that happen and how to make yep. them high performing. And um, it's more than just getting a room, getting a group of people together. And the, the book goes through uh, the difference between a group and a team and how the, that difference impacts the company, um, the performance in the company. Um, have you ever been on a high performing team? Can you think of an example? Uh, yeah, I have. And, and I, I've made the comment before because I've seen this happen where you're on a team and inevitably your team, how do you want to say this? Uh, people they they admire they observe you know they witness the high performing teams and they think you know what i want that guy or that gal that high performer that overachiever on my team so that it's hard to keep that team together either they get promoted they take another opportunity another assignment another detail so and we often don't recognize at least in my opinion what a great team it is until after the fact so you know we're, we're we're performing, we're meeting objectives, mm -hmm. you know, we're we're knocking things out. Everybody's pulling their own weight, and and you know th there's there's a chemistry, there's an energy there, and then like I said, we don't really recognize how good we had it until you know people end up falling off the team. So uh, but yeah, I've been part of, it. and the, you know the authors kind of reinforce this multiple times through the book. That the thing that that jumped out that was kind of new material for me, and you mentioned it, the difference between a group and a team. A team have to has a collective performance goal, a collective measure, and without the benefit of that, and to your point, it's a, it's by definition of a group, right? And how many times have you heard somebody make the statement, "Hey, we're a team"? 
Well, do you have a collective goal and a performance right. measure? No. Well, you're not a team, you're a group. And I, I think that's highly insightful. And one of the things that was one of my key takeaways, and I've, I've started to be more observant about different things that I'm involved in saying, well, are we a team or are we a group? We're mm-hmm. probably a group, but we say we're a team. And then we get into the behaviors too, as far as, well, is your group behaving like a team or is your team behaving like a group? So uh, there's a lot to that. And, and again, I'm, I'm really getting granular at that point, but those are just some of the key insights that I really found very, very interesting in the book. And, and that's huge. Um, I, my, one of my favorite teams I was on in work and the, my career was very early, right out of undergrad and the um, in a division of Sprint and setting up the public, it was Sprint Publishing was the company and we were setting up that division. And I think I was like the 33rd employee and um, hired in the publishing division of the publishing company. And so um, my, my boss was my mentor and there was um, there were two other supervisors under him, and I can't remember what one one did distribution. I can't remember what the other one did, but um, but I was responsible to get the publishing going, mm-hmm. and uh, that, so the team that that I brought on board, um, I would go to learn about the publishing, write up the SOPs on the plane, basically on the way back, and then teach it to them, and they'd hit the ground running, and we would do it the next day, and you know within days. And, uh, but the team, we were literally running through the office from fax machine to fax machine and staying late, coming in early, panicking, all the things. And, um, and we're still in touch with each other to this day. Oh, wow. And that was, that was before the internet or anything, you know, that mm-hmm. was so long ago. Um, and we're in touch with the, the printer back then was R.R. Um, um, Donnelly was our printer. And I'm in mm-hmm. touch with those people and um, just very bonded very closely because we were all unified in um, accomplishing um, what we were trying to do. And it was- it well, was And you had that. that goal, right? I and mean, that mm-hmm. was, the key. I, I can remember distinctly as a young young employee, you know, I was a salary employee, but we were starting up a plant. And yeah. literally, like you said, we start at 5 a.m. and we ran production till 2, 30, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And we stayed till 10, 11 o'clock at night because we didn't have systems and we were doing all the calculations yeah. by hand. And, and I, I look back on that finally, and I think I was working 18 hours a day. Yeah. I, think I was probably making $30,000 a year, Kelly. Yeah. But well, I'm still, sure I wasn't back then. Yeah. yeah. But I still remember that fondly. And, you know, we always like to say that some of the times we grow is when we're challenged the most. Yeah. That's one of those examples. And how to create that bond. Mm-hmm. And we we all gave it our all. And, yep, uh, exactly. Um, and the selflessness and all of those things and, and brought our the talents that we could bring to that. Mm-hmm. So they they talk about that in um, becoming a team. Um, so the book has three three main sections. So one is understanding what teams, what that is. And so we touched on that a little bit um, about the definition. Basically, the definition is the big difference is having that performance goal um, and then uh, becoming a team. And so they have a curve of, um, in the book, they describe how you go from a group let me just look it up. I thought I was going to remember it and I'm not. Um, uh, but basically you go from being um, a working group of people to a pseudo team, mm-hmm. uh, to a potential team, to a team, and then to a high performing team. And right. so you can go through these phases. And so as the leader uh, putting a team together, how do you take people through that curve and, um, and, and do they need to go through the curve? So we touched a little bit on that, a group versus a team. So everybody doesn't need to be, every time you have people together, it doesn't need to be a team. But when it does, how do you walk them through that um, that curve? So any thoughts about the curve? Any experiences that you want to share? Yeah, I, I, the part that jumped out to me was this, this definition of a working group. And they used the illustration of how generally leader or executive teams are working groups rather mm-hmm. than teams. And, and yeah. what's the acronym, right? Executive leadership team. The, the T is teams. Yeah. And if you follow the author's logic, which I do, I buy in, right? They're really not functioning like a team. They're functioning like a working group, which I thought was pretty individual, pretty unique. So the working group, by definition, I wrote it down here, is leaders focused on individual outcomes and results where a team relies on collaboration and decision making. Now, I don't want to give everybody the impression that leadership teams don't collaborate, don't, you know, have group think they certainly do but they're the way they operate is very different than truly what a team could be so i, I thought that was pretty interesting you know they they noted uh there was five key points you know as you made the work group the pseudo team 
So then I, I latched onto this idea of what is a high performance team and the skill set, you know, that's necessary to contribute. And I was thinking of a team that I'm working on right now and how I put that team together. And the author makes the same point. It's not about title. It's not about your position in the org chart. It's about your ability to contribute to the collective performance measure. So I could have somebody who's very junior in my organization, which I do, and I needed his IT expertise on the team. And you know what, rather than having a collection of VPs, I said, I need this person, I need this person, I need this person, I need this person. And, and you pull all these people from your organization. So, and for my illustration, everybody's internal, you could actually pull external actors into the team as well. But I pulled them all together because you know what, we've got something to get done. And, and high performance teams, by definition, get things done, right? Mm -hmm. So you're putting together the team that's going to get things done versus, you know what, uh, I've got a group of VPs that, as we talked about in the working group definition, maybe they're not as productive about getting things done. They're good about strategy, right? They're good about yeah. conversations. They're good about debate, uh, you know, good about pressure testing things. But by definition, in my opinion, again, my takeaway, high performance teams get things done. Yeah, and that I like your example of um, the getting the right people um, on the team instead of worrying about um, what the title is or can that the IT person be on a team with VPs or do, does it have to be that person's boss instead? And then exactly the inefficiencies of that and you know how often we see that in in the workplace. Well, and it, 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 I don't think our, our organization's unique. I mean, we've got VPs, me included. I can't do everything in the organization. Yeah. Uh, my job my job is to manage the team. So I'm going to the person who can make that happen. And that yeah. may or may not be the VP. It may, not, may or may not be the person who's highest in the org chart. You know, we want to assemble a highly effective team that can get things done. Yeah, I know. But a lot of them would fight that and say, oh, oh no, yeah. I can't have I can't have Bob on that team because it's my peers, so I need to be on that instead. And then they don't come to any of the meetings. And so then, but yep. Bob's not at the meetings either. So then there's all these other meetings that have to happen. The in inefficiencies that are caused by that uh, paranoia. I, I, I think as you look at the curve, you know, the five points, I, I would argue the pseudo team, the potential team and the real team are are, are inefficient, ineffective. And the two, the two, titles he calls them key points he what he used but i would focus on the working group and the high performance team and say hey if you've got a collection of individuals that are in any other stage of the curve push them to one way or the other because i yeah. don't think the other three right. is, is a is a place you want to live for very long yeah and speed it up let's go we i mean exactly. people are getting burned out because of all this kind of stuff yep. you know they're wasting time so then that brings me, I was going to take the conversation to the leader, which he also talks a lot about in this section um, of becoming a team. Um, and he talks about, or they talk about um, the leaders clarify the purpose and the goals, build commitment and confidence, strengthen the skills. Um, but also the team leaders of high performing teams do work too. Mm -hmm. They're not just overseeing the team. So I think that's a difference um, that some, some leaders struggle with that, they think they're just overseeing the team and not actually owning a piece of the the work. Um, so uh, attitude is key, not ego. So uh, have you ever worked for a great team leader, had a great yeah, experience? The, the comment I put together is I, I said, you know, we're confident that you know we've been on underperforming as well as overperforming or outperformed teams. And, you know, you ask yourself, what's the differentiator, right? It often is the leader. You can bring people into a room together and they're not necessarily a team. They may or may not do good work. They can spend a lot of time in discussion. They can you know, debate things. But ultimately, somebody's got to step forward in that leadership role. And the book is about teams. And I was pretty happy to see the author kind of pulled out of the discussion about teams, the importance of the leader. And, and I think that's important. So you say to yourself, well, how, how was the leader chosen, right? And, and I, I try to think of myself, you, you sit in an underperforming team and you start to go to meeting after meeting and then you start to say, well, let's do that quick postmortem. What are we getting done? Well, if we're getting good things done, obviously, you know, more of that high five. But if we're not right, somebody's got to step forward and say, OK, time out. You know, what are the things that we're here to do? What are our goals and objectives? What are we getting done? What's our level of accountability? All of those things. And I think that's where we get this idea of the role or the impact that a leader needs a team and a team needs a leader. So I've seen 
so many teams that they just, they just simply don't have a leader. And I think what it demonstrates is people, by definition, for the most part, there are natural leaders. But I think people like to be led. They want to be led. They need to be mm -hmm. led. So uh, I, I long ago took my MBA class at Rockers, as Kelly's talked about. And Dr. Kelly Phipps teaches or behavior at Rockers. And uh, so much of what we talk about in this book on teams falls into that org behavior and group dynamics topic. And I was so taken by it. I actually sent Dr. Phipps an email and said, hey, uh, you know, if you haven't read this one, it's definitely worthwhile. As Kelly pointed out, it's been around for quite some time. So given as well read as I know Dr. Phipps to be, I'll be surprised if he hasn't read it, but uh, oh, yeah, it uh, made a mark on me. And uh, when you said people want to be led, they, especially on a team, if they know their role, they're, they're comfortable if they know their role. It's OK to have a leader um, and the leader needs to step up. And the authors talk about two things that leaders of high performance teams never do. Um, and it, they say they never um, blame the team or they never allow members to fail. And then they um, and then they never excuse shortfalls. Wow. I see cool. that all the time. Well, but think about this, right? I mean, in the, we, we did this book together, you and I, right? This yeah. is Extreme Ownership 101. This is right. Jocko Will to a yeah. T. And as I read that, I mean, you can just see the commonality. And we, you wouldn't think that these things are, are groundbreaking or all that innovative, but, but there is a, there's a theme. I think there's a, a, a current, if you want to say that, underway in business about accountability. Yeah. And, you know, we can talk about that for a long time. The other part I think that goes through this is if we say what leaders do and don't do, leaders have a high EQ, a high level of emotional mm -hmm. intelligence. So the two things that Kelly mentions about they never blame and they never excuse, those things speak to accountability. They speak to the, a high level of emotional intelligence. So uh, I think it's phenomenal. And then if you read further down on that page, Kelly, the author makes the comment, he says, by contrast, real leaders honestly believe that success or failure is a team event. And, and again, I went right to Jocko Wilnick and he makes that statement. He says, you know what? If we fail, it's a leader. If we mm -hmm. win, it's the team. And again, the, 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 and again, this is a team book, right? About teams. But I think he spends, and, and it's not overdone. I want to be, be clear. I'm not trying to say this is a negative. I really think there's so much value from the leadership lens in this book. And it's more, it's just, it's simply more than just about teams. So high five for him, to, the, both the authors, it's a, a co-authored book yeah. taking it to highlight the impact of good leadership on team dynamics. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. I thought of that book and I, um, during reading this and I thought of um, conscious capitalism, we'll talk about mm -hmm. stakeholders next yeah. um, and speed of trust also, because trust is a theme throughout the book as well. Absolutely. Um, so all of our, um, it's kind of interesting. Maybe there's a theme for leadership that uh, com that comes out. Absolutely. Um, we we don't have time to go into it, but the book. I want the listeners to know that the book, um, the Wisdom of Teams, also talks about um, how teams can get stuck, and they give mm -hmm. several tips. I want to say a dozen or so about how to unstuck a team, get a team unstuck when they do get stuck. So um, I don't remember if it goes through the the same. Um, model that um, that I'm so used to with teams, the forming, storming, norming, performing. But every team I've ever see, worked with, seen, coached, advised, they always go through that uh, that phase. But they, uh, they, the authors do give several tips for how to um, manage to get unstuck. Um, and then they also give- I don't, I don't think the authors mentioned that, but you know, for everybody so. listening, that's that's something you probably need to write down. That's kind of, I, in business, I call them foot stompers, right? That's a foot yeah. stomper. So. If you haven't written that down, if you don't have that saved somewhere or have it on a sticky or notes in your outlook, you know, it's it's forming, storming. What what it's it's forming, forming. storming, performing, and norming. Yeah. Norming, and, and that, norming and then performing. Yeah, exactly. Norming, so write storming, that down. I mean, that's that, that's definitely worth a Google look and getting a little mm -hmm. more familiar with how that works because as yeah. you're involved with teams and you see how they evolve and the group dynamics that takes place, once you have that that lens, right, that perspective. You almost, I always think of it as like a, a ghost in the room, right? You're able to kind of step back and look yeah. and say, oh, I see what's happening now yeah. versus it's happening in front of you versus happening to you kind of thing. And you can get so frustrated, but there are ways to handle it. Um, and then the team, the authors also talk about um, um, how to close a team. And that's something that I see um, 
um, not done very well either, that the project ends up wrapping up and people are on to mm -hmm. the next thing. So taking time to, to uh, close it out um, and do a good job of that is an important step. But let's go into the next section. The third section of the book is um, exploiting the potential of the teams. Um, and the authors talked back then about predicting how teams would be the primary building block of high performance in companies. Um, I was curious when I kept reading that throughout the theme of the book, they kept talking about that. So do you think they were right? Did that happen? Did Well, and, you know, we talked about it, you did in the opening about when this was written, it was written in 1993. So then, you know, you posed the question and I, I again, I, I reframed it, did it age well, right? 1993, here we are, 2023. And where I went with that is you think about, we didn't have Slack, right? We didn't have right. Microsoft Teams. We didn't have Google Meets. We didn't have any of that. And here we are, you know, 30 years later. And I, I would ask most of our audience, because I respect we're all relatively technologically advanced. You probably can't imagine your work life without these things. And then um, consider for a minute, think of how somebody like Google, how they're structured. They're, ba they're team based, right? Think, right? think of any of the big four firms, you know, Deloitte, PwC, EY, McKinsey. Uh, they're, all, they're all team based. So I would really advocate the, yeah, I think they hit it on the head. Yeah, and here, so. here we are today with all this multi-billion dollar software that's all based on collaboration and, and maximizing the value of teams. So yeah, I mean, your question was, did they get it right? I think they did. Yeah, I thought so too. Um, and they discussed the performance ethic and um, stakeholder centered leadership um, and trust. Um, what, what actions have you seen executives take um, to make teams high performing? So the ones that are over the teams, they talk a lot about that as well. Um, have you seen executives do some of these things to help or even hurt the teams? Yeah, I, I focused on I, what I think are three. One is being able to clearly define what the performance objective are. I, mm -hmm. And everybody's got cliches, right? I, I like to say, hey, what does good look like? That's, yeah. that's, and that's, that's the, and, and pretty easy to understand. Pretty simple layman's terms. You know, the other one I like to use is I said, how will I know if we've won? And, yeah. and again, a, a simple way of just saying, what's, what, where are we going with this? What are we trying to accomplish? I, I was at a, a business function here a couple of months ago and interacting with an, a CEO and, and we, we really kind of went back and forth on a little, lot of things. And we finally got down to saying, Hey, just ask, what's the, what's the question? Right. Yeah. And, and again, so very simple and it's not overly complicated or sophisticated, but you know, you get, and you, and you've all been there, right? You've been in, the, you've been in these meeting rooms with 10, 15, 20 people and all kinds of chatter. And this person brings up something and then somebody else brings up something and there's just this banter going back and somebody eventually in the room calls time out and say, you know, what are we trying to solve? What's the question? What does good look like? And, and then all of a sudden everybody goes, well, I'm not really sure, but it gives you that opportunity to refocus. So that was one of the things, uh, the other, I had two others here. One is a so solid guideline on timelines. So you, you've seen these projects get thrown out and they just seem to go on forever with no finish line in sight. You know, it's amazing when people, and, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but throw in a deadline, people work, people do work well under pressure. Right. I know you, there's probably a lot of people out there say pressure, but I tell you what, we do our best work sometimes when we're under pressure. And then the last thing is defining what I call the scope and giving a real line of sight to the depth and energy and the resources when people say, okay, this is a, uh, maybe it's a peer to peer opportunity or it's a, an employee to the board or it's an employee to an entire consumer group, really giving some definition to understanding that the level of resources and the level of energy and the level of commitment with that, whatever this objective requires. And so those, those are the three things that I really think give a, a team an opportunity to really be high performing. Yeah, and I think along with that last one is um, those other ones for sure, is let the team have time up front, getting to know each other and what their why they're on the team what yeah. is their talent their skill their experience that they're bringing to the team their superpower yes the yeah. um working genius that uh we weren't really fans of that book but that's a cheap easy way to do an assessment that's um that they could figure out something you know and take five minutes and or 10 minutes and do a, a quick an exercise like that do a, <laughs> our disc there's great disc um leaders and facilitators and um, you know, there's all kinds of different tools and opportunity to understand why they are on the team and why their teammates are on the team and uh, what people bring. And then I think that cuts down on or that speeds up the trust 
and uh, cuts down on duplication of work. And, and uh, I've seen teams where everybody has to make all of the decisions together and, uh, and that can slow the team down and that is not high performing. So, no, I agree. Yeah, I think that's another element of that. Um, what do you think about, um, they also talked in the book about creating a high performance culture, high performance team culture in the organization. So I, 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 it's interesting that you came up with that question because I was thinking of that through the book and I, I started to say, well, creating a culture, you really don't have culture as a, a thing, right? Culture is a combination or result of behaviors. And so then I started to think about the team, you know, the team does work, but you think of like what I call, you know, work breakdown culture work breakdown structure that you have for project management. And again, I kept going back to this idea of, of behaviors. And then I started thinking about training and I started thinking about organizational behavior and, and you break it down far enough and you say, you don't really train team dynamics. You don't really train teams. What you train is personal behaviors and performance. And so I went back to thinking, well, if I was a CEO and I wanted to instill a culture of teamwork, what would I really focus on? I would focus on leadership and all the facets of that. Cause obviously I need leaders on my team. I would focus on, effective meetings, which I think is a, a an overlooked skill in many organizations. We get promoted into mid-level managers. We talk about the imposter syndrome and fake it till you make it and all those kind of things. But just because you're in that management role or you have that title doesn't mean you had the training on how to conduct a meeting. And I think we've all been in poorly run meetings. So leadership, conducting a meeting, accountability. Uh, we, I could spend a whole hour just talking about different examples I've seen where groups that lack accountability, companies that lack accountability. So uh, team dynamics, you know, how to how to show up for a meeting, how to show mm -hmm. up on a team. Uh, if you're not leading the meeting, what's expected of you? Yeah. Uh, and there's all kinds of books out there about different organizations and how they conduct their meetings, uh, meeting pre-reads, uh, all kinds of different things. I won't go down that rabbit hole. Uh, a sense of urgency. And I've really become a big fan of this. I know that seems so simple, right? Sense of urgency but I've seen things languish that I felt were high priority for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, and just trying to take the approach to just, just observe everybody on the team and just say, who's demonstrating a sense of urgency, right? Who's demonstrating the ability to get things across the finish line. And I know those things seem so simple, but mm -hmm. the best run companies teach these things. They train on them. They focus right. on them. They measure them. And again, they're table stakes, right? right. But how many, how many companies are founder led family led, you know, first generation, second generation, and they don't have leadership that's came from these traditional kind of training organizations that focus on these things. And then the last one I put on there was just time management, which is kind of a one of those table stakes. So and again, I, I grant that these are all behaviors. So I, I'll share this insight with you. I know we're getting to the end of our time, but I've talked a little bit about my youngest daughter and uh, she's now in her third week at Deloitte. So. Uh, she shared with me her first week was all orientation. Uh, they flew her to Atlanta with a group of people and she did her training. And then her second week, they flew her to Dallas and she went through uh, two weeks of training there. And the the organizer, the, the facilitator, the first week said, look around. She, she said, in five years, 80% of you will not be here. She said, we know it. You know it. Those are the facts. That's the data. And I was five really years is a long time these days. Well, but I was shocked to hear them be that bold, that transparent, huh. that that uh, out there, if you want to think of it that way, huh. about that, right? And she said, everybody in this room is probably on a path to be a CFO someplace. And everybody is here because Deloitte will mean something on your resume at some point. And the second thing is, is we will train you like no organization is ever going to train you. And so what, where, what's my point here, right? We don't all get the opportunity and the privilege to be trained in an organization like that, right? We don't all get to be in, you know, General Electric's Neutron, you know, Neutron Jack's training program. So if we're if we're going to train ourselves, and I'm going to go back to my Anley Stanley comment, we've got to ask questions, we've got to ask why, right? We've got to continue to read. So mm -hmm. think of it as your version of going through five years at Deloitte, right? But you're going to do that over the course of your lifetime. You know, continue to ask questions, continue to read, because Sandy Stanley said that's how you learn. And, and pay attention, pay attention to what's going on in the organization, what kind of teams are being created, what kind of projects are coming in. And if your skills are not being uh, are not needed on the team anymore, it's your job to update your skills, make sure you stay relevant. Um, and like in uh, kickball, when you're a little kid, 
and uh, grade school teams are picked. Sometimes they pick the most popular kids. Sometimes they pick the most athletic, but they um, they pick people that they want on their team. And if you're not picked for the team, at some point, you're uh, going to be irrelevant in that organization. And That's as true. the leaders, keeping people around when they're not picked on teams doesn't honor the people either. So yeah. figuring that out and staying aware of that is important. But for your own career, make sure you're aware of what's going on in the organization. So you know what kind of teams they are picking and why, and that your skills stay relevant. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what we hope to contribute to with this uh, leadership book of the month every month. So couldn't ask for a better ending uh, wrapping up a book than that, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Good tie in, Brett. Well, I had, you know, I, you know, next month we've got Wisdom of the Bullfrog, which is uh, by Admiral William McRaven. So pretty famous, you know, he's done that. University of Texas commencement speech, which uh, if you haven't saw that on YouTube, it's uh, definitely one that will make the hair on your arm stand up. It's definitely so good. So I, and that's we always three, talk about that's in three weeks because that Thanksgiving, yeah, Thanksgiving is it. Yeah, so that's yeah. November 16th is the next one. Yep. Yeah. So our why here, and, and I love this, right, to inspire tomorrow's leaders to invest in themselves today. So keep asking questions, you know, keep reading. And I shall always say that it's the best investment that you'll ever make. Uh, so keep investing in yourself. Yeah, right on. Thank you, Brett. You're welcome. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah, thank you for joining us. If you were here today, I kept checking to see if there were um, comments or questions. I didn't see any today, but we will uh, check the LinkedIn for any as um, um, as the next few days go by. And um, you can always get in touch with us. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you, everyone.